Yes, uh, my name is Rayvon Williamson. Uh, I'm formerly incarcerated. My name is Gus Lamoma Edwards. Everybody calls me Lamoma, which means gifted. My name is Sidney Johnson. Um, I was born in 1966. I'm 53 years old. Uh, my name is Sumit Lau, and I am 23 years old. Well, I was incarcerated at the age of 17. 17, 18 years old, I ended up cutting class and was never comfortable with my stepfamily. I ended up running the streets, selling drugs, shooting uh, holes in the pimp's cars, making them pay me and my other two little crime partners. I stole something because I wanted to be accepted for my friends and my peers because I already had that, that low self-esteem, that low self-worth coming up as a young child, right? being picked on, fat shame. So I stole because I wanted to be accepted. Just, I grew up around gang members and drug dealers all my life. Uh, that was a norm. That's the thing that a lot of the kids grew up uh, having a role model as. After being released from prison, people who have been incarcerated go through a period of reintegration into society. This transition can be difficult. When someone leaves prison, especially after a long sentence, the outside world can be intimidating. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, um, especially when you're fresh out here, new out here. You don't have transportation because you gotta wait to get a driver's license your permit. ID card. I returned to a society that uh, was different in a lot of ways. All these things that I should have learned and understood as a young person, I was trying to figure out for the first time as an adult. So it's, it's intimidating to go places or, or to be asked things that you feel you ought to know. And then also there's this aspect of new experiences, you know, new emotions that come with new experiences. So I, I think it's, it's a challenge on a mental and emotional level. I had a perception of what other people perceived me as because of my background. I thought that because I was incarcerated, because I was a former gang member, because I was all these things, a criminal, that I wouldn't get my fair shot back into society. I thought that the same people that labeled me no good, a criminal, that deemed me worthless, were still gonna feel that way. More than 650,000 people are released from prison every year in the United States. The rates of recidivism, or the tendency to reoffend, varies throughout the country. There are, in some areas, resources available to help with reentry. They provide ex-convicts with valuable connections to assist in the transition from prison to free society. Uh, my name is Kevin Ross. I'm the Assistant Program Manager for the CACR program at 111 Taylor Street. My name is Leeward Leo. I'm the Assistant Facility Director here at 111 Taylor Street. Transitional living is the process of formerly incarcerated individuals finding the necessary resources to be self-sufficient in society. Our goal here is to take people out of prison. They've been removed from society for you know X amount of years, and we're trying to structure their day-to-day -day life What's the first week look like? DMV, ID, Social Security, Medi-Cal, do all these things, you know, that haven't been done for 30 years. Get that stuff done. After that's all done, what do normal San Franciscans do? They work, right? Let's go find them a job. So get the job. Then what do San Franciscans do? Find a place to live. Place to live, we move from, you know, more normalizing. So transition from what is an abnormal experience. Prison is abnormal. Move it into a normal experience. Uh, after having served so much time for myself, I still needed that. Uh, that guidance, that accountability, uh, so to speak, opposed to just, you know, being released and like, hey, here you go, you know. Uh, so it's been a, a blessing in that sense, having a point of accountability, having people I can uh, talk to, ask questions, uh, who have had the experience of, you know, guidance others through the program. Because of the potential they have to reintegrate, each transitional house deserves an equal amount of funding. Equal funding and regulations would ensure a positive and helpful experience for all participants.
To a degree, the students do express concerns and anxieties about finding jobs once they get out. There are ways to figure out whether someone has been incarcerated or not, and there are existing prejudices against that. And we're preparing a resume. That was hard uh, because you do have quote unquote work experience, but it, Porter or kitchen helper number two doesn't translate <laughs> as simply in society. Um, so really understanding my skill set, those things that I did have to offer, building a resume, uh, job interviews, you know, uh, what to say, what not to say. Treasure Island, they train you to be construction worker, abatement, removal of um, the land of bestos and mold. And so here I am, I'm still working with that. Plus I got another job in the restaurant. We cook, we clean, we seek people, we do everything that needs to be done down on the Union Square over there in Oakland. I work as a, a Taekwondo instructor at Robinson Taekwondo in Sacramento. And my favorite part is just working with kids. I love working with kids. I love working with the youth. Like any type of engagement that they need me in, I'm there. Job resources aren't the only resources provided by transitional housing facilities. Transitional houses also provide therapy opportunities. If you don't address the person's behavioral issues first, all you have is you have an employed criminal. Now they have the resources to go out and engage in the behavior that was self-destructive in the first place. So emotional intelligence is understanding how to deal with any situation where it's not harmful to yourself or another person. And that was something that I had to learn in my incarceration through a program that was called GRIP. I haven't had no problems since I've been here at GO. Um, I got a real good counselor that works with me. Um, the staff is real friendly towards me. Um, I just basically you know, I'm just, I'm just hyped, you know, I'm just excited about everything. <laughs> Unfortunately, despite the benefits that transitional housing can bring, they are not equally funded. San Francisco is the most felon-friendly city I think that exists, arguably on the planet. Um, I don't think that other cities are going to have the amount of resources. I don't think it's going to be as, as dense either. It's not going to be all right in the same. You're not going to be able to walk to everything. Each transitional house has different opportunities, regulations, and services. Based on the wealth of the county, the quality of transitional houses can vary greatly. Right, because San Francisco has a lot of money, so therefore they, you know, they have the resources for, you know, the prevailing issues that most of the, we, you know, the formerly incarcerated as well as the homeless actually have. Um, but the smaller regions, don't have access to that capital. It's horrible. Like, I hear about some of uh, my other friends that are getting out that are in transitional homes and just the living conditions and the guidelines and rules that they have to go by. I'm sure there are transitional houses, right? I'm gonna give them benefit of the doubt that are not like that. But like I said, from my experience and my knowledge, um, these few are. What I think the government should do is make themselves more aware of how effective these programs are and then create some type of initiative or bill so that the funds can be allocated towards those regions to provide these type of resources. The annual cost per person of an ex-convict in transitional housing is roughly $30,000. Whereas in a prison, the cost per person can range from $30,000 to $170,000 per person. For every ex-convict successfully reintegrated, up to $170,000 is saved by the American taxpayers every year. These guys, this is all their second chance, and so you want that second chance to work out. But in places where resources are lacking, they may not be able to make use of it. They've already had so much difficulty in their lives and they deserve to have the same opportunities as anyone else. My biggest problem is being a family because uh, I've been let down a lot. But there, there are, even today, you know, anxieties I face, you know, fears that I face. Uh, but again, it goes back to the type of support system I have. My sister, we stay in contact. That's my biggest supporter right there because we know what we've been through 
from the age of four or five years old. She's been there every step of the way. Brad and Francie, they've been there every step of the way. People who have been incarcerated that make the decision to better themselves have unique perspectives on life. They don't just contribute to society through their work. They also contribute through the wisdom they share with others. Before my incarceration, I was just a very negative influence on my community, especially on the younger community. I kind of felt like I led them down the wrong road, and which I did. Um, and so this is just my way and my opportunity that I get to try to fix those bad decisions. And my thing is trying to really catch those young people at that crossroad where that they have to make a choice. You can go down that road or you can go down that negative road. Because if you don't, you end up holding somebody's gun. You end up holding somebody's drugs. It's a matter of, for me, how do I convince somebody to give me that chance and then allow the work to speak for itself? Life is based upon choices, right? And it's about the choices that you make in your life that's going to determine your future. If we truly want successful reintegration to be more commonplace, we need to provide the formerly incarcerated with an easy way to transition.